Good morning, Smoky Mountain. Good morning. God is good all the time. Hey, my God bless y'all for being here this morning for visiting with us today. We're sure glad you're here as well. Uh, the chairs in front of you should be like a blue card. If you can just take a moment and uh, fill that out, drop that in the offering plate when it comes by, we sure would appreciate that. If you're a regular attendee, need to update your information, have a prayer concern, be sure to make note of that, and, and uh, we definitely uh, will recognize those things. So uh, we sure had a great week here last week, did we not? Amen. Amen. And uh, they, they're off to a good start, the, our Hispanic friends next door, and uh, they had a good crowd Sunday night, a good crowd uh, Wednesday night. I got to come and be a part of it Wednesday night for a little bit, and uh, uh, just real excited about what they're doing over there. And so we have our Hispanic service uh, Wednesday night, at, tonight at 7.30, and again at Wednesday night as well at 7.30. Uh, remind our group, our church here, we have our Bible study at 6.30 here in this building, and youth group also meets at, at 6.30. As we look uh, towards the future, a couple things to make note of are on Saturday, August 27th, we are doing one of our next hikes in the, in the Smokies, and uh, we'll leave here at 8 a.m., or you can meet us out at the Chimney Tops parking lot at 9 a.m., we'll be hiking the Road Prawn Trail. If you have a question about that, I'm sure Dan could, could give you some directions and uh, help you out with that. Uh, I want you to mark your calendars for Sunday, September 11th. Uh, we're going to have a friend day here at Smoky Mountain. And I want to encourage everyone to invite and bring a friend. Uh, we're going to have an all-church uh, dinner after, after service that morning. Uh, we'll go bowling for a little friendly competition that afternoon at the Sevierville Bowling Center. And uh, this opportunity to invite your family and friends. And uh, so be thinking about who you can invite and uh, encourage them to be here on September 11th. And then also mark your calendars for Sunday, September 18th. We're going to have a brief, brief congregational meeting immediately following the worship service that day. Um, we have... Uh, uh, revised the church bylaws here at Smoky Mountain, and uh, the elders are kind of going through those and, and revise them a little bit, and uh, we need to kind of have you as a congregation affirm them, and uh, if you want to look at those, there's copies of them back there in the back of the worship center, you're welcome to pick one up, kind of review that, if you have any questions, you can speak to me or one of the elders, and they would gladly answer any questions you have about that, but September 18th, we need to, to affirm the, the new revised revised bylaws. For the month of August, we're collecting, uh, kind of amended a little bit of what we announced last week. We're connect collecting ramen noodles, oatmeal, um, not Pop-Tarts. <laughs> that was a, the spell check didn't question. We're collecting Pop-Tarts for uh, and snack cakes. If you noticed the bulletin, um, the preacher kind of, I don't know, had a little boo-boo there. So uh, uh, please bring Pop-Tarts, not Pop-Tarts, okay? <laughs> So yeah, you can all make fun of me for that, all right. I'll probably hear about that one five years from now, I'm sure. So. <laughs> Let's all stand. Let's have a word of opening prayer and we'll go into our time of, of worship. Uh, Father God, I want to thank you so very much for your goodness and your grace. Now to me, have to come together here as family and friends to bless and, and worship your holy name, God. And I pray uh, as we go through this service, our attitudes, our actions will be a blessing to you and and, Lord, I pray that your spirit will come and move in and through this service, God. Lead us and teach us. And as we gather around this communion table, Lord, as we, as we fellowship together, as we hear your word, I pray that uh, your spirit will move in us and through us and teach us and remind us and convict us if necessary, God. God, we pray to be with those who are sick, who cannot be here with us today, those who are traveling. I pray to give them safety in their journeys and bring them back home to us again soon. Those who travel to the Smoky Mountains for a little time of R&R, &R, I pray their time here is resting, uh, uh, encouraging God, and I pray that you'll give them safety in their journeys back home and uh, be ready to, to rest and ready to go back and serve you in their part of the kingdom, wherever they're from. Uh, God, we, we love you. We praise you in your son's name. We pray, and all of God's people said. loud, real loud. <laughs> I don't think he is. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels 
bowed before him, heaven and earth adored him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. two choruses are, are two of my favorite songs that, that Brian chose this morning. And one is, I stand in awe of you. And the other course that I put in was, um, what was the next course? I had it one of those senior moments. Uh, uh, huh? Isn't he, isn't he? Oh, Lord, you're beautiful. And I think these two songs really go together well. Sing with me. I stand in awe of you.
be seated. On Sunday mornings, when our alarm goes off, it's usually on WIVK, and at 6.30 to 8 o'clock, or 6 to 8 every Sunday morning, there's a radio show on called Rise Up Country with John Ritter. And they have lots of interviews and stories and things, and also music. A few weeks ago, there was one that really caught my attention and made me start thinking. The story was a man dies and goes to heaven. When the angel meets him at the pearly gates, the angel says, you need a thousand points to make it into heaven. You tell me all the good things you've done and I'll give you a certain number of points for each item. When you reach a thousand points, you get in. Okay, the man says, I was happily married to the same woman for 50 years and never cheated on her, not even in my mind. That's wonderful, says the angel. That's worth two points. <laughs> two points, he says. Well, I attended church all my life and gave my 10% tithe faithfully. Terrific, says the angel. That's definitely worth a point. One point? My goodness, well, what about this? I started a soup kitchen in my city and worked in a shelter for the homeless. Fantastic, that's good for two more points. The man, two points, the man cries. At this rate, the only way I can get into heaven is by the grace of God. The angel says, now that's what we're looking for. <laughs> and that just got me thinking, I remembered back 30 years ago, in June of 1992, I was on the faculty of uh, either a high school or a junior high camp, I can't remember which, at Lake James Christian Assembly in Indiana. And our theme for the week was grace, and it was guilt removed the camp experience. And it was loosely based on a book by Jack Cottrell called Being Good Enough Isn't Good Enough. And it was a moving, I went back and found my notes on that week. It was a way of trying to teach these young people what great, the difference between grace and law. And it started on Sunday night at the social hour when we went into the building there was a little three by three note, post-it note on each door, it said, take off your shoes. But the dean and the assistant dean was standing holding the doors open so no one saw it. So everyone at camp began the week as a lawbreaker. And the team names and everything were all chosen as lawbreaking type names, bad names. The lesson started on Sunday morning and we asked, or Monday morning, and we asked each person, if you were to die right now, or Jesus would return at this moment, can you say without a shadow of doubt that you are absolutely sure that you would be saved? And then the recreation on Monday took a change. We had the common games, but everyone had different rules. And all the while, the teams were trying to earn 25,000 points to get a new name, a positive name instead of a negative name. And on Tuesday, they had an obstacle course, and it was really different. And then we had service projects where you could earn points. During lunch each day, some crazy rule would be pointed be posted in the cafeteria and if you didn't follow them you would have to choose a penalty from the penalty box by Wednesday morning the most any team had earned 
was 19,000 points. At service project time in the afternoon, they had a tornado drill and everyone had to go to the basement of Memorial Hall and during that time, the dean said, it's judgment time. And no one had reached their 25,000 points. So the dean and the assistant dean offered to serve the penalty for all the teams. They washed and cleaned out every garbage can on the camp. And from that point on, we lived under grace. The rules of the game were changed. The obstacle course had a gift at each station that made it easier to get through. If you violated one of the laws at lunch, someone else would serve your penalty for you. At the snack shack, you could only buy food and drinks for someone else, and you weren't allowed to give someone money to buy for you. And we learned in class that the ground rule for law is break the law, suffer the penalty. Keep the law, escape the penalty. But under grace it reads, break the law, but escape the penalty. And this is what we're coming about this table to celebrate this morning. The fact that God, through his infinite wisdom and love for us, let his son suffer the penalty for each of us. And as we gather here today, we're to remember the price that he paid and also proclaim this to the world. The table is set for two reasons, to remember and proclaim. Shall we pray? Our Father in God, we're so thankful that you loved us so much that you were willing to let your son pay the penalty for each of us as lawbreakers. We just thank you so much for your grace, and as we partake of these emblems, help us to grow closer to you and remember what you have done for us and also as we go out of here, proclaim it to the world. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Proverbs 11, verses 24 and 25 says this, One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. Shall we pray? Our Father in God, you give us so many blessings. And now as we take this time to return a portion of that to you, we just praise your name for all you do for us each and every day. But most of all, for Christ Jesus, who came and died for us. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. God is good all the time. All All right. Amen. Several years ago, I read and shared a with my congregation in Indiana, a story about a devoted Christian woman named Maggie Keith, who lived in Iberia, Missouri. And uh, she was a faithful member of the first Christian church there in Iberia. And Maggie died at the age of 85. But just before she died, she developed a uh, cancer on her arm. And she went through a surgery and uh, had a large portion of her upper arm removed. And her arm looked like some big old animal taking a big old bite out of it. And they tried to do a skin graft, but it still still seemed to look absolutely awful. Well, after this happened, you know, Maggie had a a new view of life. And and she began to give her money away. And uh, she started, you know, buying gifts for people who, including a refrigerator for an elderly lady whose refrigerator had, had gone out. And, and Maggie did many other kind things for, for other people. And, but there's one that was especially interesting. Maggie had some neighbors who kind of moved in and she hired their little boy to pick up her mail for her every single day. And she paid that little boy at the end of every week a little bit of some money for, for picking up her mail every day. But not only that, in the fall of that year, she, she bought that little boy the best bike that she could find at Sears. And she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to him for Christmas, which she, she did. Sometime that following year after that, past, after that Christmas, uh, Maggie, Maggie passed away. And, uh, and, uh, and, and at, at the funeral service, that little boy's family came there to pay their respects. And after the graveside service was over, the little boy was seen standing next to Maggie's grave, even though everyone else had left. And the little boy just, just stood there for the longest time. And, and uh, finally, the minister noticed he was standing there. So he, he went over to that little boy and he asked him, are you the boy whom Maggie bought the bicycle? And he nodded that, that yes, he, he was. And... The preacher at that point had nothing else that could be said about the situation. I mean, it was obvious that what had happened there. But, but now somewhere out there is a young man who still remembers a kind Christian lady who bought him a bicycle, his neighbor who bought him a bicycle for Christmas. Maggie Keith once said, and I quote, I believe in giving flowers to the living, end of quote. And of course, what she meant by that was this. She believed in loving and blessing people while they are still alive. Now, let me say, if, if you're visiting with us today, you know that, that when someone sends flowers, let me back up. There's nothing wrong with sending flowers when someone passes away, but there can be, that can be such a special blessing to those loved ones who are left behind. But isn't it also true that we can love and bless people the very best when they are still with us, when it can make the most difference. And so, if you're visiting with us today, either in person or online, or simply been away for a couple weeks, 
Last week we began this new sermon series that we're calling How to Bless Your Neighbor. And it's all about this idea of how we have been blessed to be a blessing. See, we know again from Genesis chapter 1 that God created a world that was originally perfect and good in every way. You know, you know scientifically, and ecologically, you know, relationally, morally, spiritually. It was put together just the way God meant for it to be. But then all of a sudden, sin entered the world and everything started to go wrong. With heartache and pain also came in and the world was no longer the way God meant for it to be. And so God implemented a strategy to a guy named Abraham. And here is, again, let's read this again, the strategy that God gave to Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And here's what you're going to do, Abraham. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And the whole world will be blessed through you. So again, you can see that five different times God uses the same word, bless, to communicate to Abraham. I'm going to bless you like crazy, but the blessing must not stop with you because you've been blessing to be blessed. You to turn around and bless others. And then basically, God says, that's how we're going to win the world back to the way I meant for it to be. I'm blessing you so you can be a blessing. And those who come after you will be blessed to be a blessing. And so God implemented this blessing strategy to Abraham that God wants to continue through us today. And so in this series, we're talking about this blessing strategy. And specifically, I'm giving you five blessing practices from the life of Jesus that we can use to bless other people. Now, like I said last week, all five of these things are things that you can do. Every one of you can do these five things. And they're really easy to remember because if you look closely, they spell out the word bless. The first letter spells out the word bless. And so last week we began with the letter B. And the challenge was to begin with prayer. Specifically, the challenge was for us to start praying for the people and the places God is calling us, that God has put upon our parts, to put in our path to bless. Because here's the thing. Over and over again, we see Jesus doing this. He prioritized prayer because he knew that prayer is what opened him up to what God was calling him to do. Here's something interesting that I recently learned. Did you know that sound engineers, before they do a job, will spend 15 minutes in a silent room preparing their ears to hear more clearly? And friends, that's what God wants us from us because he says in Psalm 46, 10, to be still and know that I am God. So whenever I think about the blessing practice of beginning with prayer, it's kind of like preparing our eyes and our ears and our hearts to hear God and to see the people around us more clearly, which brings us to the second blessing practice, the second letter in the word bless, the letter L, which is the practice of learning, to lis listening to others, listening to others. Now, listening to others is a game changer, not only for the people and places you're called to bless, but it's a game changer for any relationship that you find yourself to be in. Now, again... Jesus modeled this incredibly well because he loved people by listening to them. Almost every single person that Jesus encountered for whom he was performing the great miracles for, speaking these mind-blowing truths to, he's willing to pull up a chair, sit down, and simply listen to those people who were around him. For example... In Luke chapter 18, Jesus is making his way through this city that was hustling and bustling with, with activity. And there were all kinds of people who were clamoring for Jesus' attention. But there was this one certain blind man who's kind of on the fringes of the crowd whom Jesus approached. Jesus knelt down in front of him, looked at him, and Jesus asked him a question. What do you want? And then Jesus patiently and attentively waited for a response from that man before he actually healed him. 
And what I think is interesting is that Jesus over and over again, first of all, saw the people who were on the fringes and he listened to the people who were often overlooked and forgotten, which begs the question, when was the last time that you engaged in a conversation with somebody in the checkout line at the grocery store or your server at the restaurant? When was the last time that you asked your neighbor, your next door neighbor or your coworker, how are you doing? And not just one of those passing, how are you doing kind of things, but you actually, you actually just, you, you stop, look them in the eyes and listen how they're doing. We see in Mark chapter 6, Jesus or his disciples, you know, basically for three and a half years, Jesus' disciples kind of became like his, his family. And on this one particular occasion, Jesus kind of sends them out into the surrounding communities to bless people. And, and they got to bless hundreds of people. But, but then they returned back to Jesus. And when they returned back to Jesus, they began to share their stories of, with Jesus. And, and, and we can just picture Jesus. And we kind of get the impression that Jesus just listened. Just listened to their stories of how they were able to bless others. And I bet he just, as he listened to their stories, just sat there and smiled as he listened to them tell them about what they experienced. As they were taking notes this morning, the first big idea is obvious. Jesus listens to people. And we see this over and over again in the Gospels where Jesus was listening to those who were around him. And friends, living a blessed life like Jesus is more often than not not going to be about these spectacular mountaintop experiences, but rather the blessed life is most often lived out in the regular day-to-day -day routines of our lives with the people that we regularly encounter, the places we routinely go to. And it's more about actually noticing, paying attention to, and listening to the lives of the people who, who are right there in front of us. But like we talked about last week, we said beginning with prayer isn't simply talking to God because it's about listening to God. But more often than not, I think we, we kind of skip right past the sitting and listening part. We give God our list and then we're quick to move on instead of take the time to listen to God. Because it's in listening to God that he, he prepares us to hear and to see the people and the places that he's calling us to bless. Which brings us to the second big idea. Jesus sees people. Jesus sees people. And I think the listening and the seeing go hand in hand. And I hope to show that to you this morning. And so as, I, as I've been working on this sermon this week, the Lord has, kept, has just kept bringing me back to a very specific passage that I want us to spend the rest of our time in today. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you use a Bible app on your phone or device, Open them with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. This is kind of a, a summary statement. It's in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus kind of, or Matthew kind of has these summary statements throughout the math, Gospel of Matthew. And here's one of them. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 35 through 38. Matthew 9, beginning in verse 5. We read, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw, say saw, say saw, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Robert Landrum was an author who wrote satire. A few years ago, he wrote an entire book of satire that was all about categorizing people on the basis of their behaviors and their idiosyncrasies. Did you know there's an entire field out there that sociologists call it idiosyncrasy? which categorizes people by their idiosyncrasies. And in this book, Robert Landry talks about some of the idiosyncrasy categories. For example, he talks about the Kristen Kringles of the world, 
who are the women who are totally obsessed with Christmas year round. Got any Kristen Kringles in the house this morning? How about the asphalt rangers, who are people who live in the city, but they wear backpacks and hiking boots every single day, asphalt rangers. WRs, WRs are adults who, like every single day, they have a different t-shirt on it with a Warner Brothers character on them. You know some Warner Brothers? How about stretch abitionists? These are perhaps my favorite. Stretch abitionists are people who go to the gym in their gym clothes, but they never seem to work out because they simply stand around and kind of stretch the entire time while talking to whoever walks by. Stretch abitionists. I find this to be a little funny. And I actually like some of these idiosyncratic categories. And one of the most beautiful things about Jesus is that he saw people, not strictly in terms of their idiosyncrasies or their behaviors or even their labels, because he saw beyond the exterior of their lives. Now, with that being said, how many of you have heard the phrase, the eyes have it? All right, a few of you have heard that phrase, the eyes have it. After we're done here today, my hope is you'll never quite hear that phrase the same again. The eyes have it. Matthew tells us that when Jesus saw the crowds, I want you to pay attention to that word saw, we read that Jesus had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's how Jesus saw them. He saw them a certain way. He saw them like sheep without a shepherd, which might not make, mean a lot to you all because, you know, most of us are city slickers, but it most definitely meant something back to those people back then. It was an Old Testament phrase that was used to describe a group of people who lacked leadership. They lacked spiritual leadership. They lacked a shepherd. Now, just think for a moment about the kinds of crowds that were around Jesus. Just think about this. Word gets out about Jesus' ability to cast out demons. So demonized people were in the crowds. Word gets out about his capacity to heal people, so every kind of disease and malady of people were in the crowd. Word gets out about Jesus' preaching and teaching, his affinity for the poor, so they were poor in the crowd. Word gets out about Jesus interacting with the immoral of the day, the adulterers of the day, and before you know it, there were, there were prostitutes and tax collectors in the crowd. There were white-collared people like tax collectors in the crowd. There was blue-collared day laborers like the commercial fishermen in the crowd. Word gets out about Jesus healing a Roman centurion servant and a Canaanite woman's daughter. So there were non-Jews in the crowd. And so you see, there was this melting pot of every kind of label and category of people imaginable in the crowds that were around Jesus. So if Robert Landrum was alive in Jesus' day, then he could have written a book about this crowd because they were people with all these labels, yet Jesus doesn't speak of them in terms of their labels. He sees them as harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, preacher, what does that mean? Well, let's think about sheep for a minute. Uh, a sheep without a shepherd is not quiet because they make a lot of obnoxious noises. Sheep without a shepherd are not peaceful because they, they're anxious, they're, they're restless, they're, they're, they're confused. Sheep without a shepherd are not nourished, which means they need somebody to lead them to green pastures and to good water. Sheep without a shepherd are, are not safe because they tend to wander into all kinds of trouble. And so you see, this is not a compliment when it says that Jesus sees them as sheep without a shepherd. And the way that Jesus see them, I want you to hear this. It'll be on the screen behind me. Jesus saw the people were the way they were because of where they were in their relationship with God. I know that's a tongue twister. Read it with me. See it with me. Jesus saw that people were the way they were 
because of where they were in their relationship with God. They, had lack, they lacked spiritual leadership. They lacked a shepherd. Furthermore, this was not the way the religious leaders of the day saw them. For example, a lot of the religious leaders of Jesus' day thought the way a lot of religious leaders do today. They think that because they, 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 they think that sickness and poverty is, is a sign of disobedience in, in some way because they think sickness and poverty is kind of God disciplining you for being unfaithful. Now, now to be clear, I, I'm not suggesting that. But that is what they thought, and, and even some of Jesus' disciples thought this way. In fact, in John chapter 9, the disciples saw a blind man, and do you remember what was the very first thing the disciples asked Jesus? Yes, his disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned, the man or his parents, that he was born blind? So see, even the disciples thought sickness and poverty was a sign of God's judgment because they, they were either the, either the person rebelled or perhaps their parents rebelled. However, the difference between them and the religious leaders is that the religious leaders, they would, they would withdraw from the sick of the day. And that's for the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the, the adulterers in the crowd. They're, they're, these, these were the kind of identities that repelled people. So again, the religious establishment would kind of withdraw from the crowds where Jesus saw and did something different. He looked upon the crowds and he saw them as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus felt compassion while a lot of the religious leaders felt contempt. Because they thought, well, these people obviously had some bad things happen to them because God is dealing with them because they've been unfaithful in some way. D.A. Carson is an old scholar, a longtime preacher. He talked about a time when he and a friend of his were at the beach. D.A. Carson was kind of in the California area on a speaking engagement and they, had, they decided to go to a beach for some much-needed peace and quiet. And, and while they're at the beach, there was this group of about 100 teenagers that were gathered there. They're in Southern California, just north of San Diego. And there's about 100 teenagers gathered around a fire. And they're, they're partying. They're, they're basically partying. They're, they're, they're loud. They're being a little bit obnoxious. And, and there's beer cans all around. There's hard liquor bottles all around. And, and they're playing loud music and being pretty noisy. And D.A. Carson says he's just getting... He's perturbed by all of this. I mean, he said, I came here for some peace and quiet. And so he's, just, he's, getting, he's, getting, he's getting mad about it. And, 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 and so he, he, he turns to his buddy named Ken. He's going to just basically unload to his buddy Ken about what they're seeing there. And, and so, and so as, as D.A. turns to Ken, he notices that, that Ken is just kind, of, just kind of staring at this mass of teenagers gathered around this campfire, parting with this faraway look in his eyes. And Carson, before he get an angry word out, Ken, without even looking at Carson, was just staring at these kids and he said, high school kids, what a mission field. D.A. Carson kept his mouth shut. What I'm about to say next is really profound. And you'll want to write this down. In fact, I always say this is what you pay me for right now, what I'm about to say, so listen up. Lost people act like lost people because they are lost people. Let me repeat that. Lost people act like lost people because they are lost people. I've heard even some of you talk about the people out there, oh man, man the people are just getting, they're, they're getting, they're, they're terrible. You know, you know, all those people out there, they're just terrible. Yeah, they are, because they're lost. They're lost. Lost people act like lost people. You can't expect them to have their act together. They're lost. And friends, there are times when you and I do things in lostness and wandering because we ourselves are wandering. Listen, write this down. How we see people makes a big difference in how we respond to them. Amen? It's interesting where this passage in Matthew's gospel falls because there's already been a ton of miracle stories leading up to this passage. 
I mean, Jesus healed um, the, the, the diseased and sick. He's raised the dead. He's calmed a storming and raging sea. He's, he's cast out some demons. He's, he's done every one of these things to meet some real needs of people who were suffering. And yet, when we get here to Matthew chapter 9, Jesus saw in human beings a far more serious problem, a far more serious need than simply some demonic possession or poverty or sickness because Jesus sees the problem of lostness and they needed a shepherd. This is why, this isn't to say that Jesus wasn't concerned about their physical needs, but rather it's to say that Jesus didn't stop there. I think in the church we do a lot of times do a great job of meeting needs, but we stop there. You see, Jesus wasn't satisfied with simply raising the dead or healing the sick or providing a meal or, or freeing the demonized or teaching a, a good old lesson. He did all those things, but he ultimately sought to move beyond those things to their greatest need of all. Most of you might remember the story in Mark chapter 2 about these four dudes who were bringing a paralyzed man to Jesus and so, Jesus, so that Jesus could heal him. And, but because the crowd was so large, they couldn't get their friend in to see Jesus through the front door. So they climbed to the top of the house. They dig a hole in the roof and that Jesus is teaching in. And they created a, created a skylight without the owner's permission, you know. And, and so there was Jesus in, in the middle of this house teaching. When all of a sudden the roof starts to cave in, in front of him, and, and everybody kind of looks up. That's what we would do. We would all kind of look up, and, 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 and then all of a sudden this man is being lowered down in front of, of Jesus' feet. Jesus looks at the guy laying his feet. It's obvious what his problem was. He was paralyzed. But do you remember what was the first thing Jesus said to him? You're healed? Nope. The first thing Jesus said to him, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, when they lowered their, their friend to Jesus' feet, they weren't thinking he needs to be lowered in front of Jesus to have his sins forgiven. And the guy laying there wasn't looking up at Jesus saying, oh, I sure hope he says my sins are forgiven. No, I mean, the, the problem was obvious. He was paralyzed. This is what they want Jesus to fix. Yet, what was the first thing Jesus addressed? Jesus, first of all, forgave him of his sins. And may I suggest it's because Jesus was staring, starting with the bigger problem. Jesus then proceeds to heal the guy so that everyone could hear and know that Jesus had the authority to forgive sins. And the point is that sometimes Jesus sees a different problem than everyone else sees. And he starts there. Again, Jesus sees people in terms of their relationship with God before he sees them any other way. But do we, church? Do we see people in terms of their relationship with God before we see them any other way? Because let me tell you that there are times when Brian Powell is like Robert Landrum, where I'm labeling and categorizing people on the basis of what I see and how they behave and how they talk, and I allow such things to influence how I respond. And it's not always positive. I will tell you, the Spirit of God is working on me and in me, and he's constantly saying, Brian, I want you to have x-ray vision. I want you to clean your ears out. I want you to have the kind of vision, the kind of hearing that, that considers somebody's spiritual condition before all that exterior stuff. This is the kind of vision that enables us to look at somebody and think of them from an interior perspective instead of the exterior perspective. This is the kind of vision, the kind of hearing that no longer relates to people on the basis of their exterior, how attractive or unattractive they are, how big or how small they are, how rich or how poor they are, how intelligent or unintelligent they may seem. This is the kind of vision, the kind of hearing that no longer looks at people, listens to people in terms of what they can do for us. Or how they might be inconveniencing us in some way. Listen, there are a lot of people who look at other people. And all they think is, you can either help me or you need to get out of my way. Maybe some of us in this room, online, are very utilitarian in this view, our view of people. And every person that we, we, we come across, our thinking can be they can either help us or they need to get out of our way. 
In other words, we view them in relationship to us. How they make us feel. What they might do for us. View them more in relationship to us. But when we begin to view people and see people the way Jesus sees them, then they're no longer just our waiter. They're no longer just our mechanic. They're no longer just a teacher or a doctor or a coach or a bank teller or a checkout person providing a service for us. We're not nearly as obsessed with what they can do for us, how quickly they can do it for us, and how much they are inconveniencing us. With this kind of vision, we begin to look beneath the exterior of their lives, and it puts us in a position to not be so easily offended by or easily bothered by them. And we begin to ask, here's how you can know when you're looking beyond the exterior. Here's the question you'll find yourself asking. Where is this person with God? Where is this person with God? Chris Seidman is one of my favorite preachers. He preaches down in Texas. And uh, I recently heard him tell a story about a lady in his church who was on her way to work one morning, early one morning, and, and she pulls into a convenience store to get some gas. And, you know, you know what it's like at 6, 6.30 in the morning. You're just still trying to get your, yourself going. And you're just kind of, uh, you're just feeling kind of blah. You haven't had your coffee yet, your Mountain Dew yet or whatever. And you're trying to wake yourself up. And she noticed in the parking lot there was a police car that had pulled, up, pulled over a vehicle and the driver was being given a breathalyzer. And her heart, just, her heart just broke, and she felt compassion for that young man. And so she finishes putting, putting the gas in her car, and she decides that she's going to get a little closer to kind of see and hear what, what was going on. And, and, then, and that's when she felt the urgency to ask the police officer if she could perhaps pray for the person in the backseat of the squad car. And unsurprisingly, he said, I, I don't think so. And she said, okay, okay. And, and she said, she began to back away, and... Then she said, well, could, 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 she, could she pray for the police? Can I pray for you? Well, is there anything that I can pray for you about? And he said, no, thank you. I'm, I'm doing just fine. And again, she kind of begins to say, okay, and begins to back away. And, and this as she's, she's about to leave. She says, well, is there anything that I can pray for when I get back in my car as I'm driving to work? No, no, ma'am, that's, that's okay. So this lady's telling this story to her preacher, Chris. And she's just talking about how foolish she felt. She just felt kind of foolish how she conducted herself. And, but let me tell you something, church. I think she sees more clearly at 6.30 a.m. than most of us do all day long. And I think that for a couple of reasons. Number one, she didn't see a drunk that morning. She saw a person that might just be a sheep without a shepherd. Now, I'm by no means suggesting that drivers shouldn't be arrested and disciplined because he needs to be taken off the streets in that moment. And that officer was doing his job. But the question is, this is what this lady was asking, who is going to address the person's soul? Because I have a hunch that when he sobers up, begins to address what's really going on, when that person's soul finds rest, He'll never find himself in that position of being arrested again. Number two, the second reason why I think she sees so clearly is the fact that she didn't simply see a police officer. She looked beyond the badge, beyond the squad car. She saw a human being himself who might need a shepherd. And regardless of what side of the law you're on, regardless of what side of the tracks you're from, we're all like sheep who have gone astray, according to the prophet Isaiah. And it's just all about how we see people. Will it be through the eyes of an idiosyncrologist? Or will it be through the eyes of Jesus? And will we look at people and say what D.A. Carson's buddy said? What a mission. Friends, I hope you're thinking right now about the people and places that you need to be praying for. The people that you live around, that you work with, that, that you play or socialize with. How do you see them? Have you taken time to just pull up a chair 
go sit on the front porch with them, you know, go have a cup of coffee with them to listen to them. Because like we said a couple of weeks ago, almost every relationship starts with listening where we hear their hopes and dreams, where we hear about their fears and their sorrows. It's where we begin to hear how we might be able to bless and serve them. We can't do that by just, hey, how you doing? And keep going. Liz Bohannon is the founder and CEO of Sasco Designs, and I, I love the story how she developed her company. When she was fresh out of college, she had a passion for helping girls who live in extreme poverty, and she talks about uh, a video she saw called The Girl Effect. In this video, she learned that if you invest in one girl's education who lived in extreme po poverty, then there would be a ripple effect not only within her life and her family, but also within her village and her country. Eventually, there would be this ripple effect that would change the entire world. So Liz Bohan had quit her job, bought a one-way ticket to Uganda, and with a single goal of meeting one person and getting to know this person. When Liz got to Uganda, she didn't simply make one friend. She made three friends. And in getting to know these girls and listening to these girls... She discovered that they were in a leadership academy and, and that was where they spent these, these two years in this leadership academy. And they were the best of the best from the most impoverished areas of Uganda. And so at this leadership academy, they, they'd be preparing for college. Now, again, keep in mind, these, these girls live in they're the most impoverished girls in Uganda, and, but they're the best when it comes academically. And so they're in this leadership academy preparing to go to college. But after they apply for college and if they got into college... There would be this nine-month window, this nine-month gap where they'd have to return home to work and save money to pay for college. But what Liz discovered as she began to get to know these girls, actually sit down and listen and listen to them, she discovered that, they, that when they get back to their villages, there was oftentimes no jobs. So they didn't have a means of making money and consequently were not able to further their education. So Liz decided that she's going to start a nonprofit organization and a charity where she said, we'll raise the money for you. But I want you to, I want you to catch what happens here. As Liz got to know these girls, and how did she get to know these girls? By sitting down, looking at them and eye to eye, talking to them, listening to them. What she learned was that these girls didn't want charity. They wanted a job. There are still young people out there today who want to work. All right? There are. So don't be looking down at all these young people thinking they're all just lazy, don't want to work. They, they, want, they, wanted the, they wanted a job. All right? They wanted to earn a living in a dignified way to pay for their education. So out of her listening to them was born Sasco Designs. That was a little more than 10 years ago when she went to make one friend. And since then, she's had over 106 girls who've been funded through her company. She employs more than 70 people in Uganda. She's on track to help 25 girls provide for their through her company and help them get through college by impacting one person at a time. Because she took the time to listen to them, get to know their stories, and how she could serve and bless them. I absolutely believe, Smoky Mountain, that we can change the world. We can change Sevier County by blessing people one at a time. But to bless Sevier County, we would have to begin with prayer, which we talked about last week. We have to listen. We have to listen to God, and we have to listen to the people and the places where we live, where we work, where we eat, where we play. Listen, church, Jesus saw people in terms of their relationship with God, and when we... When he saw them with his eyes, what he saw with his eyes flowed down into his heart. And his heart was filled with compassion because of how he saw them and what he heard from them. Now, it could be the whole time I've been up here talking, some of you can't even begin to imagine seeing others because right now, you're sitting there thinking, I'm the one that feels lost. I feel lost this morning. In fact, as I read those words, harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd, you thought, preacher, that's how I feel right now. And I want you to hear that there's no shame in that. 
There's no shame in that because every person you meet is someone whom Jesus thought enough of to die for. And that includes you and me. So maybe the place for you to begin on this journey is to just lift up your head in the direction of the good shepherd, the great shepherd, who has laid down his life for a sheep, which means he has laid down his life for you. And maybe your first step is fixing your eyes. I, Elaine did this. The Holy Spirit led her, I know. Turn your eyes upon Jesus was the song she played during communion. Do you notice that? So maybe this morning what you need to do is, is fix your eyes on Jesus. So if you're thinking, I'm in a season right now where I feel lost and I'm wandering. And Brian, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of nibbled my way into loss. And which, by the way, by the way, is how sheep get away from the shepherd. They just kind of focus on the patch of grass that's right there in front of them. They, they just kind of nibble themselves from one patch of grass to the next, never looking up to see where they're at in proximity with the shepherd. Most people nibble their way into lostness. Don't we all? And maybe right now, I'm telling you, lift up your head. Turn your eyes. Fix your eyes on Jesus. And, and let us pray and help you today. But hopefully for most of us in this room this morning... Let's, let's fix our eyes on him and ask him to fix our eyes. Because we need to, new eyes. We need Because the eyes have it. And so as we finish up this morning, I want to leave you with two questions to ponder. And they're very similar to what we talked about last week. Number one, who are the people and places that we need to see here in the same way that Jesus sees and hears them. Write them down. Write those names and places down like I challenged you to do last week. And keep writing them down. We're going to come back to those before the end of this series is over. Because sometimes we see people, but not in the same way that Jesus sees them. And then secondly, who's in your mission field this week? Or as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9, who's in your harvest field? This week. Who are the pe names of the people and places that you can bless this week? And again, let's, let's build up to friend day. All right? Make a new friend. Invite them to see Jesus. Invite them to know Jesus. All right? And, and then go be a blessing to them. Amen? Amen? Let's stand. We pray for me as we go into our time of, of decision time. Father God, we thank you so very much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you that you saw us before we were even born. You saw us in our mother's wombs, God, where you formed us and shaped us, God, and you saw our needs. And so, Father God, I just pray in Jesus' name that, that we'll, we'll turn to you, the great shepherd, the good shepherd. And Lord, uh, that we'll just, we'll see you and, and that God will allow you to work in us and through us, that we will see the people and the places around us that we can be a blessing too. That we can point them to Jesus, the Savior and Lord. Point them to the great shepherd of their souls. God, I, I, we love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' most holy and precious name. And all of God's people said. Amen. So this morning, if you've got a decision to make, won't you come as we sing this song? Maybe it's a first time decision to say that I believe that Jesus the Christ and We'll walk you through that process. Maybe you need some prayer this morning. Maybe you feel lost. You just need some encouragement. You want to celebrate something. You want to be a part of the Smoky Mountain family. Won't you come as we sing this song, Sanctuary.
crisis. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Father God, we thank you for the time we've had to come together here as family and friends today, Lord, to celebrate you, to communicate around this table, God. And I pray now that we will go out to that harvest field and that we will be, as Jesus asked, Jesus prayed for, that we will be the workers in the field. God, we, we now are just, we're, that's, that's our task, go out there and be a blessing like crazy to the people we will meet at the restaurants today and our families and our workplaces, wherever we go this week, Lord, may we just be a blessing. God, we love you, we praise you. It's in your precious son's name we pray. And all of God's people say. Amen. Let's, let's sing this last song. Let's go out and be a blessing. Amen. Amen. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the dark is shining. Jesus, light of the